Professor Zecker is a professor of history at St. Francis Xavier University, Nova Scotia, Canada, where he teaches courses in race, immigration, social movements, and U.S. history. His research includes immigration, radicalism, and the popular culture of immigrants on the left. He's the author of many articles and journals and the author of four books, as well as a chapter in another book about civil rights, he, um, <clears throat> which is forthcoming. Before entering academia, Professor Zecker was a journalist in his native New Jersey. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. And if you want, you can share your screen. Oh, okay, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, well, let so me. I think I got to. <clears throat> I think I have to be made co host or something. No, I just let you share. Okay. So oh, okay. Yeah. Share, share and share alike. Uh, Okay, uh, did, let's see, do folks see it now? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Um, and I'll make it big so you can really see it. Okay, uh, well, first I'd really like to thank uh, Helen and, and Georgine uh, and the society, the Washington uh, Society for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak with you and also to revisit Streetcar Parishes, um, which was my dissertation and then, you know, a, a book, uh, but it's been a while. Um, and to give me the opportunity to talk about Solbach parishioners, um, uh, particularly at uh, St. Agnes, St. John de Pomacene in Philadelphia, uh, people I knew, wow, almost uh, 30 years ago now. Uh, uh, and again, although it's been some time since I was last in Philadelphia, uh, the stories I heard at those parishes uh, really remain vivid and warmly remembered. Um, and this first slide is somebody I knew uh, when she was a bit older, <laughs> much older than this, but this is a woman named Josephine Gaidosh who was uh, at the flag unveiling uh, at uh, Slovak Hall in Philadelphia in, uh, I think she said it was 1930 or so, uh, at Fifth and Fairmount in Philadelphia. It's not there anymore, but... Uh, I'll talk about it. That was one of the centers of uh, Slovak Philadelphia. Um, and I'll start by saying too, that my paternal grandmother uh, who uh, helped raise me and my brothers uh, was Slovak, uh, although from the greater Garfield Passaic, New Jersey area. Um, so while I turn my exploration of Slovak Philadelphia uh, into research, uh, I'm reminded that a grad school buddy uh, said of all of us uh, back then, uh, we all think we're writing our dissertation, but we're all just really doing our autobiographies. Um, so maybe guilty as charged. Anyway, I hope uh, what I say today uh, will be, uh, I don't know, academic, rigorous, uh, interesting at least, I hope, um, in exploring how Slovak immigrants went about building their communities when they emigrated to the US in the late 19th and early 20th century. Okay, let's see. Ah, success. Um, so anyway, this is a map of Philadelphia. I really like maps or an outline of it, uh, showing some of the main uh, neighborhoods and the churches uh, in uh, Slovak Philadelphia. So uh, the problem I set out to examine uh, when I first got interested in migration uh, studies, immigrant studies, was how a small group, the Slovaks, created a community for themselves if they could never control uh, their own piece of the city, the traditional ethnic ghetto, in which nearly all residents shared the same old country home. Small immigrant communities, uh, invisibility continues to be a problem uh, for historians who to this day, by and large, look to the neighborhood ghettos of larger immigrant groups when seeking uh, their research uh, uh, prey. Um, this conception of the urban immigrant ghetto uh, community was uh, uh, as existing in bounded time and space uh, began even earlier with the progressive era reformers. I'm thinking of people like Jacob Riss um, and the settlement house uh, movement. Writers and reformers had a profound interest in uh, the bad effects of the urban environment on human behavior. Uh, the impulse to regard problems as environmental uh, was strong in this movement. Um, so of course they saw immigrants as carving out ethnic spheres uh, in cities. 
Students of the newcomer's living conditions often conceived of the immigrant as living, working, worshiping, and socializing within localized uh, but dangerous ghettos. Um, and maybe I'll question a little later uh, if even for large immigrant groups such as East European Jews or Italians, um, this was actually uh, an accurate uh, uh, conception. Did they always exclusively live among their own kind, even in New York or Chicago? But for now, let's just say uh, Slovaks never had the numbers to claim any one part of a metropolis such as Chicago, New York, and certainly not Philadelphia as all their own. Um, instead, Slovaks uh, lived, uh, like other small immigrant groups, uh, dwelling in close proximity to members of a variety of other ethnic groups. Um, in Philadelphia, I'll get to in a second, right? All of these neighborhoods, uh, and the big four, I guess I'd say, were Northern Liberties, uh, 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 a neighborhood called Point Breeze, or less uh, nicely also referred to as Polak Town, sorry, uh, Nice Town, and Sarthwark, uh, all of these places were multi-ethnic. Um, even other cities, right, in Chicago, in a 1914 study talked about the 20th Ward, uh, dubbed the Slovak Ward, uh, but admitted that not even a third of the neighborhood was Slovak. German, Irish, Lithuanian, Jewish, Polish, Bohemian, and even American families, uh, presumably old stock white uh, Americans, lived in streets adjacent to the Slovaks. An area commonly regarded as belonging to one group was actually quite polyglot. Um, and I guess you could say there were these layered ethnic communities. Um, and the pattern was repeated even in places, like I uh, said a moment ago, uh, that were uh, larger ethnic groups, uh, immigrant neighborhoods. An 1897 survey of New York's Yorkville neighborhood, the Upper East Side, uh, indicates that while the area was regarded as one of the main communities of the city's Bohemians, in reality, it was very polyglot. The New York Public Library had collaborated with opening uh, uh, the first foreign language branch of the New York Public Library. And by the way, this is, I always love because people think it's uh, the, the Spanish or, or Latino, right, that had their first uh, foreign language branch. 1897, New York Public Library opened on the Upper East Side, the Bohemian branch. Uh, but a settlement house uh, uh, studying the neighborhood noted that 45% of the branch's readers were actually of German stock, 20% Bohemian, and 6% each Hungarian, English, and Austrian, and again, 10% American. Uh, American, right? Uh, in a 1918 settlement house survey revealed of the same neighborhood um, an actuality of ethnic groups, with Bohemians leaving even in the same buildings with Irish, Jewish, Slavic, they didn't specify, maybe it was Ruthenian or, or Slovak, uh, Greek, German, Hungarian, Polish, French, English, Italian, and Russian residents. Three years later, uh, the settlement's annual report contained a survey listing the Yorkville church children visiting the settlement house as the following. Bohemian, Hungarian, British, West Indian, uh, Scotch, Puerto Rican, uh, Swedish, Irish, Italian, Finnish, Syrian, Austrian, Russian, Turkish, German, Moravian, French, Croatian, and American. Uh, and again, even the Lower East Side, regarded as the Jewish area, had a similar, in a 1916 settlement house uh, uh, report, a similarly polyglot uh, uh, mixture. Um, okay, so how was the peace kept in such multi-ethnic, even multi-racial neighborhoods? Uh, historian Olivier Zenz uh, offered a clue. Uh, Zenz uh, studied the neighborhoods of 1900 Detroit, colloquially term in, uh, 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 termed the Irish neighborhood, there's a Cork town in Detroit, uh, German and Polish, and discovered a myriad of ethnic groups in those uh, areas where the groups claiming the streets as theirs never constituted a majority of residents. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. What occurred instead, Zunz discovered, was what he called block front clustering, where one side of a block might contain all or mostly Irish families, while around the corner, a different block front, and that would be you know, one side of a street and the other side of a street, 
where they intersect. He called that a block front. Um, another block front might include Poles or another group. The same streetscape thus was shared with different uh, groups developing nodes of settlement in close proximity. Moreover, Zun said uh, that it was the neighborhood landmarks that gave a neighborhood the distinct uh, uh, claiming uh, quality. Uh, a Polish citizens club or a St. Stanislaus Paris uh, might mean that the neighborhood was regarded as Polish, even if around the corner other ethnic uh, institutions uh, might exist. By such a mechanism, Zanz declares, uh, various immigrant groups develop cognitive maps, you know, a map in their head. This turf is ours, highlighting the institutions that stamp Cork Town as Irish, or in the case of South Philadelphia, Polak Town, sorry, right, as Polish or Slovak or Ruthenian, um, while airbrushing, you know, uh, wiping away in your mind the social clubs, residences, and churches that didn't belong to your group. Uh, those buildings, those people constituted somebody else's community. Um, so similarly to Zunce's Detroit, Philadelphia neighborhoods were sites of overlapping or near overlapping ethnic communities. For example, in Nicetown, um, and I don't know why I, I haven't figured out why did they call it Nicetown? Uh, it was, uh, uh, bisected by railroad tracks, uh, steel mills, um, not necessarily, you know, a paradise, although a nice neighborhood, right, but a working class neighborhood. Um, uh, nice town did have block fronts where there were almost entirely Slovaks on Denny Street, Newcomb Street, but right around the corner in the 1900 and 1910 censuses were Italians. Um, and by the way, there was also an African-American nice town, uh, Roy Campanella, uh, who was the catcher uh, for the Brooklyn Dodgers way, way long ago, grew up in nice town. And there was uh, a Negro League uh, a baseball team in nice town. Well, this was decidedly not part of Slovak nice town. All right. So the idea behind this is that small immigrant groups uh, uh, did have a way of creating community even if they didn't own all of these uh, uh, neighborhoods own, right? Uh, so for small immigrant groups, I'm, I was left wondering, right? Whether geographically bounded ethnic quarters were an accurate reflection of community uh, formation or was there some more subtle means available? Uh, where and how did immigrants find and maintain significant social relations? What institutions were created by smaller ethnic groups that enabled them to adapt to a harsh multi-ethnic industrial landscape? And so, as I used to uh, always be told in newspapers, worked in newspapers 30 years ago, don't bury your lead, right? You know, put it right up there. And if I haven't buried my lead already, um, the answer, of course, for Slovak uh, uh, Philadelphians and Slovaks and other groups elsewhere in the country was that community was created institutionally and translocally. It was the churches, it was the social halls, it was the social halls uh, um, and translocally, right? You didn't necessarily uh, uh, socialize or worship with people who lived around the corner from you. Institutions where Nasha Ludia congregated um, sometimes 12 or even 15 miles away um, uh, was where community was formed. Uh, they might claim uh, 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 particular parts of the city uh, as theirs, uh, but they selectively saw those people in nice town uh, who were Komoda, right? Uh, Lansman, as they say in uh, Yiddish, um, but forgetting about the Italians, the African-Americans or the Irish who lived a couple blocks away. Real community for Nice Town uh, was centered a long streetcar right away. Uh, community was an elastic imagined concept uh, of creative uh, geography making. Um, and Nice Town is about 12 miles north of what was, and I don't know if it reads on this map, uh, uh, the little red cross was the site of St. John Nepomucene, the uh, Slovak Roman Catholic church that they went to 12 miles uh, uh, south. Um, so this is the idea, right? Translocal uh, migratory uh, uh, communities. Okay. 
Um, now, Slovaks might have been especially adept at community uh, making uh, in this creative cognitive mapping way, because even in the old kingdom of Hungary, they often lived in diffuse settlement patterns that meant people from one village often traveled miles to another village to be with their compatriots for worship, work, uh, or recreation. The Slovaks who migrated to Philadelphia primarily came from two regions well-versed in living in multi-ethnic places, creating cognitive maps, distant journeying to reconstitute community. Um, and one group, the group in Nicetown and also that uh, Point Breeze slash Wrightsville slash uh, Polak Town neighborhood uh, came from a cluster of villages near Humana uh, in the Eastern province of, or Old Hungary province of Zemplin. Uh, uh, and there's a map showing some of the village. I'll, I'll talk about some of them, not all of them. Um, uh, a Philadelphian, Hel Helena Gaidos, the uh, sister of the woman whose picture I showed, explained to me at one point, in Zemplin, one priest served the five towns, Kashkovda, Lubisha, Yablona, Han Hankovsa, Lubachov, a seven mile wide parish where her parents' village, Kashkovta, was only a fifth of a congregation. Helena said once a month or every five weeks, a mass would be said at the church of a particular village. And then the people from the other three or four villages would walk to mass there. And somebody else was appointed to be the caretaker for each of the villages for that place's church. This sort of arrangement served the Zemplinski well when they created an even more dispersed parish St. John the Pomacene in 1902 in Philadelphia. Parish located in South Philadelphia, but parishioners coming from 12 or 15 miles away. Small neighborhoods in Philadelphia were the target destination of this old world cluster. Another man from Nicetown reported they were all from five towns over there. So these people knew each other more or less because their fields were close together or they met in the villages they would be three villages that were right along the river. The river, river is called Laboritz. And the first village and larger village was Lubisha. Then the next village, approximately two miles apart, uh, would be Hankovtsa. And I don't know, it's like kind of right up there. You can Kashkovtsa, Hankovtsa, Derechov, Lubisha, some of the places I'm talking about. Uh, off to the side, again, approximately a mile and a half, two, two miles with Lubachov against the hill. You couldn't go any further. And then the other village was up against the other side of the river and up against the mountains. A lot of the people from Nicetown were from these five villages. And again, religiously, this was one parish. They had a Roman Catholic church and chapels in the other places, five places uh, served by a priest uh, who on staggered Sundays, right, would visit the various uh, uh, places. By the way, this happened in other groups too. There's a really interesting book about the Swedish immigrants to Minnesota who had uh, uh, several remote uh, villages uh, tied together by a Lutheran parish uh, um, and they traveled by boat each uh, Sunday uh, uh, to the uh, place where the mass was staggered, right? Uh, uh, Polish uh, uh, parish of Zabrov also like likewise actually composed of one village with several smaller uh, sending villages around it. Um, all right, so the idea behind this is, right, that uh, people knew you had to make your community where your uh, uh, Komodo were. Um, uh, the need to accommodate two diffuse religious and ethnic communities was uh, a familiar problem too. Um, not to the same extent as when they came to America, but uh, these places, Zemplin, uh, and the next one that I'm gonna talk about also had uh, German populations, Polish populations, Ruthenian, which is, I don't want to step in on any landmine here, right, but is that Slovak or is that a separate group? Jewish populations, of course, as well. Um, uh, so one did not just live among one's own kind. And by the way, also these villages usually had Lutheran uh, parishes, Roman Catholic, and at least in the East, right, uh, uh, Greek Catholic, right, uh, churches as well. A uh, constant reminder to Slovaks, they were not alone in the polyglot Habsburg Empire. Um, now, uh, if anything, the second chain migration uh, to Philadelphia, which came from the Western province of Trenchin, 
uh, 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 constituted people were even more uh, familiar with uh, a, a, a wider multi-ethnic world. Um, uh, this was the home uh, to the drotery, uh, the itinerant wire workers, tinsmiths, tinkers, uh, who as early as the 16th century had traveled far afield from Slovakia, as far as Vienna, Silesia, Russian, uh, the Balkan uh, area, the Baltic areas, the Balkan areas, repairing pots and pans. During the 19th century, Slovak tradesmen increasingly divorced work uh, site from the place they regarded as home as they wandered around fixing pots, plates, uh, uh, things like this. Um, uh, uh, tinkers camped along the Kisica River in Trench and already by 1900 could be heard conversing in dozens of languages uh, for they had been traveling to the wider world, some of their families for over a hundred years. Uh, these rotary of the Trenchian villages, such as Kisica, Kapsa, uh, Dolny, and uh, uh, Dolny Hrychov, uh, and these are places, by the way, that people left to go to Philadelphia starting in the 1840s. Uh, uh, these places, as early as the 16th century, uh, had sent their sons out into the wider world, fixing pots, fixing uh, plates, and things like this. Um, and I haven't been there, but there is a, 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 a museum in Zilina to the Drotary that, you know, is where some of these images uh, are taken from. Um, now, in 1840, the first that we know uh, Slovak who arrived in Philadelphia, a man named Komara, uh, 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 came from this area, one of these uh, Drotary. Um, and uh, 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 he didn't stay forever, but uh, he went back to uh, Slovakia, but starting in the 1880s, some of these people from Trenchin uh, uh, started settling in Philadelphia uh, permanently. Um, now, uh, a man named Emil Nekaranek, who I interviewed, uh, explained how this came about, uh, how these wandering pot fixtures uh, uh, developed. Uh, they were the tankers, he said. They roamed all over fixing things. I understood they were forced into it because they were in a particularly poor area where people couldn't knock down their house and just build a new one, you had to fix everything up. You know, don't throw away a broken chair, don't throw away a broken pot, you fixed it with wire. They got very good at it. They could do anything with wire. Um, and you could see this is how they like held together a cracked uh, uh, pot uh, or, or plate with this kind of metal work around it. Um, it was these men, another woman told me, who went around the villages, I understand, they would fix pots and pans. Somebody said they fixed uh, stuff like pots uh, that were broken or anything, they'd go around and work. Um, and uh, there became all these kind of uh, jokes too about these guys. Um, uh, apparently, uh, one joke had it that when Christopher Columbus discovered America, the wandering drotery were already there on the beach, right? Uh, and they were drunk and kind because of, they had a bad reputation too. Think of the uh, stories of the traveling uh, salesmen. You know, they were kind of like these guys. Uh, but the point for, uh, I guess, the cognitive building of maps, these guys would live for years at a time in places like Vienna, but home, right, was always back in the village. And as they traveled, they usually established uh, almost like what we have today, like the first Catholic Sokol or something. They had self-insurance societies, uh, uh, traveling insurance funds. Uh, they usually lived together, you know, in their own community in multi-ethnic uh, Vienna or Austria or uh, uh, Russia or something. So whether on the road or at home, uh, community was something more expansive than one's immediate neighbors. Community building in this homeland also entailed a creative conceptualization of space, of accommodating and acknowledging the existence of others while building one's own institutional network. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to skip because I'm always terrified that I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, uh, oh, and anyway, uh, so the point for Philadelphia, though, I will stress is that there were two separate chain migrations. These Trenchian came from far west, like right over the border is today's Czech Republic. Uh, and the people I talked about first, Zemplin came from the east. They were Slovaks, right? But they were 
from pretty far apart uh, uh, and distinct cultural regions of Slovakia. This is going to become uh, uh, significant uh, to them anyway, once they get to Philadelphia. Okay. Whoops. So there's Philadelphia again. Uh, the for I said it already, but I'll say it fast. The four most prominent, there are other neighborhoods on this uh, thing that I'll mention in passing, but the four most prominent places of Slovak settlement, uh, and I would call them partial communities, beating a dead horse, right? They were always multi-ethnic places. Uh, uh, they were pieces of the whole, but insufficient to stand as self-contained Slovak communities. The four were nice town up in Northern Philadelphia, uh, Northern Liberties, which is just North of the old colonial part of Philadelphia. So if you know Philadelphia, it's like between Vine Street and Gerard Avenue from the Delaware River out to, depending on who you talk to, Fifth or Sixth Street. Uh, Southwark, the colonial Southern part of the old colonial city and far out uh, right on the uh, Schuylkill River near the uh, gas works, the oil refineries, uh, Point Breeze. Um, all of these neighborhoods, right, were shared by other uh, uh, groups. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, the Slovak community had to be formed uh, uh, creatively. All right, so the Slovak migration, like I said, was actually two separate chain migrations. The Zemplin folks settled primarily in Nicetown to the north and 10 miles away near what they called the Gaizoni, the gas works, the oil refineries uh, in uh, uh, Point Breeze. Um, and a man there said, don't think uh, streets, think mud, think dirt. I mean, even into the 1930s, this was part of Philadelphia, but I would say, you can't call it rural, but sort of non-built uh, industrial, but there's no like paved streets, no street lights, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, the second chain migration was the people, those Drotary and others from Trenchin, who mostly wound up in Northern Liberty, the old colonial neighborhood, just nor north of downtown. Uh, again, more or less Vine Street, Gerard Avenue. Uh, this area, 12 miles Northeast of Wrightsville, was multi-ethnic in 1910. Germans, Hungarians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, East European Jews, Swiss, Polish, Italian, Irish, as well as Slovaks, right? Um, now, uh, the problem also uh, with this is that the Slovaks uh, also uh, were from a different part of uh, Europe. So they thought of themselves on a different ethnic uh, uh, class plane, let's put it that way, of the people from Zemplin. So when it came time to build a church, uh, they decided, okay, we need a parish. Where are we going to put it? The Little Red Cross, St. John the Pomacine. The church was actually an old, um, I believe it was Methodist, and it was a Protestant church, uh, but they bought it and opened it in 1902 in South Philadelphia which from 1902 until its closing in the archdiocese, by the archdiocese in 1979, was actually located in the heart of Italian South Philadelphia. Now I'll immediately say even Italian South Philadelphia was multi-ethnic, but it wasn't part of any of these immigrant neighborhoods. Uh, uh, anybody who knows Philadelphia, it's not there anymore. Uh, but if you know Pat Stakes, uh, one of the two big cheesesteak places. It was right across the street from there. It was eventually uh, knocked down after the parish uh, consolidated uh, uh, at the archdiocese's behest. Um, uh, but it was not anybody's uh, neighborhood. The trolley from Nicetown had to travel 12 miles to get to uh, uh, St. John de Pomacy. Um, and again, Pat Stakes, uh, uh, one of the men I talked to at that point was a young kid in the 1920s, right, said uh, his parents would always give him, like, as a bribe. He would say, uh, why do we have to go down there? You know, it's it's so far, and there are churches in our neighborhood. Uh, and his parents would say, well, after Mass, we'll take you for a cheesesteak. Um, and he was right, right? That's a nice town. Uh, trolley would go by Irish St. Stephen's Parish, Polish St. Ladislas Parish, German St. Boniface, but 12 miles away was the Slovak parish, right? Um, now, 
some of the parishioners could walk. Uh, Southwark on the map, right, is about three, four miles away, right? And that's a far walk, but people could walk there. But most of them were coming from even further afield. Oh, well, I just, I'll skip over that one. <laughs> that's my ancestors or, or grandma's cousins in uh, Eastern uh, Slovakia. I forgot to mention them. Uh, uh, they're uh, from the East. They didn't go to Philadelphia. Uh, they went to Passaic. Uh, that's the parish. That's St. Agnes. I, I do not have a picture. Uh, St. John's Nepomucenes, the first parish was knocked down in 1979. Uh, if you watch the movie Rocky, it makes a cameo in Rocky uh, because Rocky is getting a cheesesteak and it doesn't say, hey, that's St. John of Pomacy, but he walks past on the way to the gangster who's helping him out a uh, car and there it is. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's gone now. Um, all right, so some people, right, could walk to St. John of Pomacy, but most of the parishioners and here's a schematic, and I had this plotted, right? There's the uh, uh, red uh, uh, cross, it's St. John, John the Pomacene. Here are the parishioners from 1904, 1902 to 1904, whose addresses I could locate. And you can see some of them close are up here in Nice Town, some in Northern Liberty, some kind of close, but yeah, if, if we look at the, Thing. That's still about two or three miles away, uh, some even further to the northeast, uh, and then a big cluster out in uh, Wrightsville. Um, so 34 families that I found, 18% of the parish were from Southwark. And again, those are the people who could walk. It would be a far walk, right? Uh, but not uh, impossible. 23%, 45 families came from Point Breeze. Um, this was two and a half miles to the west um, and remained one of the sending uh, districts to St. John right up until 1979. Uh, the Golden Jubilee book of the parish uh, shortly before it closed or, or whatever that is, a 75 year uh, uh, Jubilee book uh, honored the living pioneers of South Philadelphia, uh, the pioneers of Nicetown, the pioneers of uh, Point Breeze. Um, the other mainstay, Nice Town, was even further away. Uh, for those people, again, it was a 12 mile uh, 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 journey to uh, uh, St. John Nepomuceno. And the final group, uh, Northern Liberties, uh, was integral to the new parish. 56 uh, per, uh, families, about 29% of the parish, uh, were in Northern Liberties. Soon, though, uh, they refused to sit in St. John the Pomacene, and it had nothing to do with Philadelphia uh, 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 geography. Uh, they were from Trenchin. The people in Nicetown, the people in uh, Point Breeze were from Zemplin, and multiple people I talked to by that point in their 80s and 90s still remembered the friction that led to a divorce. Um, the people from Nice town said of the people from Northern Liberties, the Easterners, the Zemplin said, well, those people in Northern Liberties, you see, they thought they were on a higher plane. Uh, they were artisans, they were craftsmen. We were from the rural part of the East. The people from the East, he said, were looked down on. I mean, they would shake hands and I'm paraphrasing what a guy told me and still see his face. Uh, they might shake hands, but doggone it, they didn't play a rig around the rosy. Another woman said to me, we couldn't possibly sit in the same parish. And I said, well, why not? She said, well, there were different words. They said for potato, zemyaki. And we said, bonyaki. And she looked at me as if I was supposed to be. And I was like, and she said, see? And I was, oh, oh, well, for whatever reason, right? These two groups and other people said, we couldn't understand them. They spoke a different dialect, right? But for whatever reason, these two groups broke apart. And this is the parish that's still there. In 1907, the people from Trenchin petitioned the archdiocese and they got a parish St. Agnes, which was in the heart of Northern Liberty, is in the heart of Northern Liberties, 
it's still there. Um, and they built a new parish. Now, when they built it, right, the archdiocese said that all Slovaks north of Market Street would belong to St. Agnes, and those south of Market Street would belong to St. John the Pomacene. But there was an exception. The archdiocese said, quote, except the Slovaks in nice town and people, and again, that was 12 miles to the north. It would have been far to get to St. Agnes, but it was even farther to get to St. John Nepomucene. And one man confirmed, he said the Slovaks in nice town, they came to St. John Nepomucene. They spoke the same language. Again, the language. Nice town had to come a great distance to come down to St. John, but they came there, right? Um, and transient nat natives, let's see here. This is the parish of St. Agnes. And you could see, right, uh, hopefully on this, uh, a big, far more, right, you know, people from the local community. But there were people in what, what became Southwest Philadelphia. There were people up to the north. And this little dot over here, Clifton Heights. Clifton Heights is outside of Philadelphia. It's about 12 miles uh, uh, to St. John, uh, St. Agnes, excuse me. Uh, it was a mill village, though, where Slovaks were working in uh, woolen mills, textile mills, woolen mills. Um, and they were also from Trenchin primarily, right? So they would travel. Eventually, in 1930, St. Agnes opened a chapel there, uh, uh, the little flower chapel, right, which was served by, you know, a curate. Uh, the, the main priest remained uh, in Northern Liberties. Uh, but, you know, geography was cognitive. It depended uh, based on uh, where in uh, uh, Europe your family uh, came from uh, and over time, of course, uh, where your parents uh, had come from. So to some extent, right, St. Agnes was more localized than St. John's. In the early years of the parish, uh, this is a slide based on the 1923 annual uh, uh, uh uh, pew ranks, right, uh, 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 parish dues, uh, and, and I could correlate uh, to addresses, uh, uh, about 53% of 441 families uh, came from Northern Liberty, but already there were people in Clifton Heights, Southwark uh, in the South, three miles away, Mania, uh, uh, this is this cluster in the Northwest here, uh, various parts of North Philadelphia. Um, and it got even more diffuse, right? By uh, 1923, uh, uh, the people from the immediate neighborhood uh, were already a minority of the parish, about 44, 43%, uh, but nevertheless, right, people were already uh, traveling from far away. Um, and even early, some of the, I don't know how to describe, big fish in, in little ponds, uh, uh, the prominent uh, members of the Slovak community, uh, we're traveling from far distant. These little green dots in the Northeast are in a neighborhood called Torresdale, uh, which is part of Philadelphia, but at that point, semi-suburban uh, 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 addresses. A family named the Burko family, B-E-R-K-O, uh, were some of these droderies, some of these wire workers, um, and they had a factory. Already by 1907, uh, uh, they were living in Torresdale. By 1915, they were even in Frankfurt uh, Avenue and Academy Road, which is about as far out as you can go uh, and uh, hit the city limits. Um, now, uh, it may be that those who moved out of the neighborhood uh, remain some of the most dedicated parishioners because that was where they could demonstrate that they were successes. Uh, no slam on the Bercos, but they were not Rockefellers or Morgans, right? To their neighbors, they were probably immigrants, uh, used different words, nastier words to white ethnic Amer white native born Americans. Uh, but back in the parish, they were a pawn. They were a big shot, a mister, a somebody. Uh, and uh, they did, right, uh, uh, contribute in the 1923 uh, annual financial report um, uh, they are uh, contributing $50 above their annual dues, right, uh, uh, to their parish. Um, other parishioners, right, in Clifton Heights, others, I couldn't plot, they're off the map, were already in the suburbs, literal suburbs uh, uh, north of the city. 
Uh, now, how is this parish held together? Uh, uh, diffuse partial communities uh, selected collectore, right? The ushers. Uh, this was the practice at both St. John's and St. Agnes. Neighborhood collectors, uh, uh, St. John of Pomacene, uh, had uh, people who were designated, I would say almost ambassadors uh, from Nice Town and Point Breeze. Um, a man told me again, uh, years ago, there never were envelopes in church. There was a special collection, church dues collected by the ushers who were assigned to different areas in Nice Town uh, in Philadelphia in the St. John the Pomacene Parish. I made a visit to every home in Nice Town. I knew old Slovak people personally. Uh, his name was Michael Straka. Now, when he uh, canvassed uh, uh, Nice Town, there were other in the first 50 years of St. John Nepomucene, ushers for Northern Liberties, Kensington, six miles north of the church, Nice Town, Southwark, Point Breeze, Gray's Ferry, these other diffuse neighborhoods. Um, and uh, so this parish could be uh, held together in a similar fashion. Now, one of the other things, and, and maybe people know about this, right, was uh, the social activities or uh, entertainment, but also this was religious, right, activities that held the parish together. The Yaslichkari, uh, the wise men, theoretically, right, who came uh, and uh, visited the manger of the baby Jesus. But these uh, plays became a little more than that. Uh, St. John the Pomacene had these Yaslichkari who made the trip to Point Breeze, Nice Town, and elsewhere, uh, sites of revelry controlled anarchy, um, but also a Slovak claiming of the streets. They made the whole route in Nice Town. Then they used to go to South Philadelphia. Then they'd go out to Point Breeze, Snyder Avenue, one man told me. Then they would go to West Philadelphia. Then they would go wherever the parishioners were, affirming the streets as Slovak. Never mind that St. John of Pomacene, the church was 12 miles away, and the neighbors across the street might be Italian or Irish. These elements of Carpathian Yaslich Curry persisted in Philadelphia for decades. Hairy coated shepherds roamed the city to the cadence of, again, ribald songs. Uh, just like the Drotary, these guys had a reputation. Uh, they would sing religious songs, but then one of the songs translated, and I won't do the Slovak right, we are looking for the baby Jesus but we also wouldn't mind finding a little glass of beer and a kobasi, right? And they would be treated. The guys said, women came to the door. These guys would bring this little church and ask for a collection for the church. And then they were given something to eat, something to drink. Um, and they became a little more inhibited, uninhibited. A man said to me, it's a little stiff. We were amateurs doing this. But after a few drinks, we got to loosen up. We would dance and sing and shout and chase the kids and hug the women. It was a real festive time. And as you went from one house to the other, you'd improvise a little more. At the fifth house, we were all loosened up and you know what to do. You'd say something and you'd mess up, you know, just improvise. It was also kind of, a guy said, uh, a way to get the kids to behave. The people with the ax would chase the kids, joking around and say, behave or Santa Claus is not coming. But the point is, as they traveled, they went, one man said, to every parish uh, house in the parish, Wrightsville, that Point Breeze neighborhood, wherever people lived in West Philly, then they'd get in the cars and go visit them in Pollock Town. Then we'd go out to Gray's Ferry. Um, and initially, right, this was uh, done on the uh, streetcar. Nobody had a car. By the 1940s, people were beginning to do it by car. And one man said this did continue right up until about uh, 1945, the end of World War II. And then he argued uh, or, or said, uh, American born parishioners found this a little irrelevant. Uh, and this man, Michael Straka, said he had to explain after that why you know, they weren't coming around. Now, there we go. More glue holding the diffuse ethnicizing community together was provided, and most of you guys probably know better than me, uh, uh, the Slovak Catholic Sokol or the Slovak Gymnastic Union Sokol, uh, these uh, sporting events, these sports leagues. Um, uh, and in Philadelphia, 
again, people told me they had basketball uh, competitions, baseball between other uh, uh, towns, Allentown, Bethlehem, Trenton, uh, Camden, uh, out in the coal uh, areas. Uh, people said they took flatbed trucks out to uh, the games, uh, baseball or basketball or, uh, you know, gymnastics. Uh, and uh, Philadelphia would bring along uh, some people from St. John or uh, St. Agnes to uh, support them. Uh, and on the left there, uh, for decades, uh, I forget which uh, station it was, but a Philadelphia radio station had the Slovak radio hour uh, uh, playing a blend right, of uh, uh, Slovak uh, radio uh, music and uh, American uh, uh, songs. Um, probably they wanted to keep peace, right? By this point, 1930, through uh, 70 or so, uh, there was St. John Nepomucene and uh, uh, St. Agnes, the uh, Zemplin Parish and the Trenchant Parish. And uh, the two announcers for the program, one from St. John, one from St. Agnes. Um, another uh, way to keep uh, the glue maybe holding the community together was Slovak Hall. And again, Slovak Hall, was gone by the time I arrived there. Uh, it was at Fifth and Fairmount, but it was a community resource. The woman there, Josephine Gaidosh, was a member of uh, the St. John the Pomacine congregation. She grew up in Wrightsville that, uh, or Point Breeze, uh, but in Northern Liberty was this hall. And both St. John the Pomacine and St. Agnes were shareholders in it. That's where they held Divadlo or uh, theater, that's where the bigger dances would be. Um, and again, that was a flag raising ceremony on uh, one Labor Day uh, and she was dressed right like the Statue of Liberty. Um, so this was the glue, I would argue, right? Holding the community together, these kind of community resources and uh, uh, ethic uh, or immigration historian Milton Gordon uh, talks about the idea of ethnicization uh, people were becoming Slovak American, right? The American flag. And I don't know if you noticed, even with those uh, uh, Jaslichkari or, or Gubachka, they were dressed, right? In traditional, whatever that means, uh, Slovak shepherd costumes, but uh, with the axes, they had two US flags, right? Uh, or baseball, right? What could be more ba uh, uh, American than baseball? Uh, and uh, just to uh, admit I cheated. This is from Garfield where my family grew up and it's a Polish lodge, uh, but I love the photo uh, and it's people my dad knew uh, in this uh, base or grandpa, excuse me, knew uh, in this uh, photo, but uh, baseball, right? But it was, pre it, or basketball, but uh, these teams were ethnic lodges, in this case, the Polish National Association. Uh, but again, the Slovak Catholic Sokol at St. John Nepomucene had a baseball team, uh, but you were learning it in a Slovak milieu, right? You played against other Slovak Catholic Sokol baseball team. Yes, you rooted for, in Philadelphia, I guess it would have been the Phillies. Uh, you rooted for the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, right? But you learned these American things uh, in uh, an ethnic uh, community. Um, now, one last thing I wanted to talk about um, which I didn't do so much in the book because it wasn't in the forefront of my head uh, at that point, but that was a long time ago. Uh, like Georgina, I think, said, um, I've become more interested in, I'll just say it, left wing, uh, which I'll even be more honest, the communist uh, ethnic community. Uh, uh, there was a Slovak Socialist Workers uh, Society, and it was a shareholder in uh, uh, Slovak Hall in Philadelphia too. Um, that was another uh, way the community was held together. And I found out some of the St. Agnes parishioners, uh, uh, and I'm not gonna name names, I don't wanna be McCarthy, uh, but you know, I found the names of some people who were parishioners there, and uh, but they were also members of this group. Uh, which itself was, of course, uh, uh, a trans-local or trans-geographical uh, 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 community. One woman uh, attended a convention of the American Slav Congress, which was during World War II and after uh, 
a pan-Slavic uh, left-wing group supporting the war effort, but also continuing Soviet-American uh, friendship. It did get McCarthyized, but she attended their national convention and wrote a letter about how happy she was to be meeting other Slovak lefties, right, from Philadelphia, from Chicago, from New York. Uh, so uh, this community, and, and I'll just say, some of the people I interviewed did tease out some of this to me. They didn't explicitly come out and say it, but they said, well, there were people there at Slovak Hall, and we called them non-believers, uh, but we went to their events anyway, because, you know, there were theater groups. Uh, and one woman said, there was a man I won't say his name. <laughs> He's dead. So, I mean, is, is the McCarthy committee going to come after him? But she said he was such a funny comic actor. We'd like to go see him. And then when I was doing the research on this Slovak socialist worker, said, oh, he was a member of this group too. So he was a funny guy. He was a good actor. The community went to see him too. Now, the coda to all of this, uh, ironically, these battles, and they were, not fisticuffs, right? Between Westerners in St. Agnes and Easterners in uh, St. John, the Pomacene uh, were rendered moot. Uh, and let's see, I'll go back for the heck of it. There it is. Uh, ironically, uh, uh, it all came to naught. Two separate parishes for two separate groups of Slovaks. In 1979, both parishes were facing declining enrollments the archdiocese ordered the consolidation of the parishes. Initially, St. Agnes, the one I'm here, was supposed to have been closed, but the parishioners there appealed to the archdiocese, making their case to the archbishop that they were more viable a community. Uh, hence, he reversed himself, the archbishop, and in 1979, St. John the Pomacene closed and the parish was consolidated and it is now officially St. Agnes, St. John de Pomacy. When I was in Philadelphia from 1993 to 2000, the parish, of course, was even more translocal with senior parishioners driving in from Philadelphia's great Northeast or suburban towns, uh, even as a few parishioners' uh, uh, mainstays were still walking only a couple blocks uh, in Northern Liberties to get to this is fifth, uh, fourth, Street and Brown Street. Um, still, uh, and I don't know what's going on there now. I've heard horrible things. On uh, uh, the right, there is the former school, St. Agnes School, closed in 1969, but the social hall there was still being used in the 90s uh, for dances or even after mass, you know, coffee, etc. Uh, I've been reading uh, that there is now uh, a move to sell it uh, because it's not used anymore, not the church, but the hall, uh, and have it torn down and build uh, uh, housing in Northern Liberties, which uh, ironically is now uh, somewhat of a gentrified neighborhood, uh, which it was not even in 1999. Um, anyway, the, the parish does hold together, and uh, it is for different reasons now, translocal. Um, and perhaps that's only uh, the latest version of a Slovak community, which always was, as somebody told me, that always was a parish on wheels. Um, and I hope they uh, do continue because uh, they were a, a lovely, lovely community. Um, and even just briefly revisiting some of this, I, I can still uh, see their faces and hear their uh, very vivid uh, stories. Uh, so I hope that was somewhat interesting uh, and not not too uh, uh, diffuse. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Professor Zecker. <clears throat> if you want, you can um, stop sharing your screen. Oh, yeah, so yeah. And I'll see each other. <clears throat> And I have two questions in the chat. Let's see what they are. <clears throat> Frank Luther says there were probably more Slovaks in the three suburban Slovak parishes. I guess of Philadelphia, there was Bridgeport, Phoenixville, and Coatesville. So that, I don't know if you know anything about the suburban parishes. Yeah, um, well, thanks. Um, and 
I, I guess you could call them suburbs, but, and of course, a lot of people have written and, and we know uh, not all suburbs are created equal, but, but, you know, just for people who don't know them, right, they were kind of little industrial towns, not that far, what, 40 miles or 35 miles to the west of Philadelphia. Um, and one of, one of the men who I interviewed grew up in that Point Breeze, but was at that point a Monsignor at Phoenixville. Um, and yeah, those were maybe, uh, uh, I don't know about numbers. Uh, and and if is that your uh, area or, or home or, or that, were they bigger or was it just they were smaller places? So they seemed and probably were more uh, Slavic uh, or Slovak. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, but by the way, all those sports leagues and uh, Sokol events and slets and whatnot, um, there was the, the National Slovak Society uh, had regions in the Southeast Pennsylvania region did put together uh, the uh, uh, lodges in Philadelphia, Trenton, uh, I'm forgetting the other, but Phoenixville and Bridgeport and those other places. So they were definitely... I didn't talk about that. They were definitely part of the uh, community for Philadelphians. Either they had friends or relatives there, but they certainly would compete against them or attend their events. Uh, and and I'll just say it was a lot easier. Well, now with a car, I guess it's easier. But um, these these trolley lines went these places too. Interurban trolley lines or, or rail lines where it was a lot easier. Uh, Today, you know, unless you've got a car, you can't get to Phoenixville or, or Bridgeport. Um, but, but you know, it was a, a long ride, but it was easy enough, and they were connected. But yeah, they probably were more vibrant, and uh, because they were smaller towns, with a, a you know a per capita, let's put it that way, bigger Slovak community uh, in them. I don't, I don't know if the person who asked that wanted to. I don't see that he's on anymore. <laughs> so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I was looking at Brian. I thought you said it was Brian, but and Brian's like, why are you looking at me? <laughs> Frank Luther. Yeah, Frank, he was on oh, earlier. Frank. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Bill Trappen is saying, well, how about the Ferco string band? Ah, how about Ferco? And and for those who know, and I didn't grow up in Philadelphia, but by the time I was leaving after seven years, I was like, I'm gonna miss this place. They were and I believe they still are the most successful mummer, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, those golden slipper guys who not just, but on, certainly on uh, New Year's Day perform with the saxophones and banjos. And Ferco was a Slovak and their headquarters, I don't know if it still is, was in that Point Breeze area. Um, and again, that's a Philadelphia thing, but that's a Americanizing or ethnicizing or Philadelphicizing thing that that uh, you know uh, this this Slovak gentleman uh, who I think was a pharmacist, the original Joseph Ferko, um, uh, created. Um, yeah, yeah, and and I don't know, is there some because that's a, a New Year's Day ritual, um, and I, I always wondered was he that pre-existed right those string bands and mummers right goes back to england yeah, that and goes way back yeah way back but but it it strikes me as having some consonance or similarity if i'm i hope i'm not sure to those yaslich kari those kind of jokey christmas hmm. carolers uh at, but yeah ferco uh was was a big deal i have his uh, because there's a, a, a Mummers Museum in Philadelphia, and uh, they had the book. There's like a Joe's Boys, a Joseph Ferco, a history of the Ferco string band. Yeah, they, they were uh, a part of that community too, yeah. Okay, our next question from Helen. Do the churches that still exist today have Slovak priests? Ah, um, they did when I was there and people, oh, his name was Francis Landaki, uh, and he was, he was great. And they did once a month, you know, still have the mass in Slovak. 
Uh, but even when it was English, there would sometimes be songs. And he he was from Bridgeport, Pennsylvania, uh, to begin with. Um, but he was priest there when I was there and for a long time. He passed away in 2016. Now, I don't know if even before that he'd retired. Um, and when I was contacted about this and I got interested and was hoping I could find a photo of John de Pomacine, uh, there's on a Facebook, you know, there's a Facebook group for everything. There is a history of St. Agnes, St. John. And uh, that's where I heard that they're now in negotiation. Can we save the former school? Uh, but the priest there now is Dennis Gill, which sounds Irish. Um, so that's the problem. Yeah. Um, for 42 years. And that was another thing that kind of helped St. Agnes, they had one priest, and that's in the days, of course, before, I think, it, uh, and I'm a bad Catholic these days, but I think at 75, right, you're supposed to retire if you're a priest, or unless you get a, uh, but this guy, uh, John Yurick, was for 42 years, then he, re, he died in 63, the priest at St. Agnes, then they had a few others, but again, not quite for 42 years, but they had from about 1986 to whenever he either retired or died, uh, Landaki. But I, I don't know if they have uh, a priest who can conduct the mass in, in Slovak anymore. Yeah. There probably aren't too many Slovak speaking no. people left anymore in that area. No, no. <laughs> Next question is, were there Slovaks from other regions of the country of any sizable number? And if so, how did they mix in these parishes? Would Spish immigrants stick with the Zemplin immigrants? Also, was there any post-World War II immigration you know of? Ah, oh, well, they're probably, I mean, I mean, I, I, so long ago since I looked, and of course, uh, sometimes in, to answer the stuff about people from Spish, which, which is my family is on the border uh, or were, I mean, it was my great grandparents, that uh, thing I forgot to talk about that showed those four babushkas. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I would imagine they would have probably felt more comfortable there. But I wonder if, uh, by if say they had come post war, World War II, would by that point the differences not have mattered as much? As far as people coming as so called displaced persons, um, after World War II, there were some. Um, now, some, there was one man in the parish when, when I was there who had been born in Philadelphia, but then his family returned, and he actually, and I'm, this is not naming names for other, he actually served with the Slovak Armed Forces in World War II and told me he was very happy to have met Monsignor Tizo and shook his hand and I changed the subject, uh, didn't want to get in that. But he came back, and there were others uh, who uh, did come back after World War II um, uh, to, to uh, Philadelphia. And, and uh, Dr. Stellaric, who I think you uh, said uh, yesterday had given a talk for you, he, he was, yeah, he was director uh, of the Balch Institute, and of course is Slovak, from Canada. Uh, and when he lived in Philly, he had left Philadelphia before I arrived, but he attended uh, St. Agnes and uh, by that point, St. Agnes, St. John the Pomacene uh, and was a big supporter. So there were, yeah, people who came in uh, later uh, uh, post-World War II and, and in his case, well, I don't know, maybe the 1970s or 80s, yeah. And I can add that, um... <clears throat> In my personal family, I found some collateral relatives who um, lived in Philadelphia and on Bonsall Street. And oh, okay. I'm not sure what neighborhood. I was going to ask you what neighborhood that was. I but, think that was Grace Ferry, which was not Grace Ferry. Yeah, I think I think that was Grace Ferry, and that was like right along the Schuylkill River, but like north of that Point Breeze neighborhood. I mean, they were, and I'll just say a lot of times immigrants settled 
in proximity to work, like I didn't, yeah. I didn't, you know, how deep into the weeds do we want to go here? But like that South Park neighborhood was primarily people who were sailors or dock workers or teamsters uh, because that is where the ships were unloaded on the Delaware River. And those neighborhoods were really multi-ethnic because it was like, well, I'm a Swedish uh, a sailor and you're a Slovak dock worker, but you've got to be there if you saw the movie on the waterfront in the 19 teens and 20s and even into the 1930s, it was the daily shape up. You show up at 6 a.m. for a job. Uh, so of course you didn't necessarily, maybe you'd like to live close to your parish or, or your your friends from the old country, but you had to live close to where the job um, was. Yeah, yeah. But I well, think Bonsall was Grace Ferry, yeah. Well, they're in the obituary for one of my, you know, I, I try to find them in the obituaries and they said, the service was held at St. John Nepomucene Church. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they, they would have been, but they were from the Sharish, um, from the village in Sharish County okay. in the old country. They were, um, you know, I tried to trace them back, but I found them through a DNA match. But yeah, in oh, the wow. 1940 census, they were living on Bonsall Street. So now I know a little bit more about the neighborhood. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <clears throat> but it, that was an answer to Michael Kaponik's question. They were from Sharish. So that's even that, further that, east than Spish. Yeah. And, and they mm -hmm. probably then felt, oh, okay, an Eastern parish is more uh, amenable to us. Yeah. Because, and, and I forget the exact numbers, but they weren't large communities in the Grand. So, and by that point, you know, the, the, the idea of an ethnic uh, Catholic parish was already being downplayed in the 40s. Uh, so, Probably like if they had said to the archdiocese, "Hey, we need a third Slovak mm -hmm. parish," they would have been told, "Go, go over there." Yeah. yeah. Regarding uh, other cities, uh, Pittsburgh has a very large population of Slovak. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, my <clears throat> wife is a Marco. That's why I asked that other question. But her family uh, settled in Pittsburgh, and with the uh, a lot of employment opportunities in the steel mills and coal mining. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them uh, formed their, they actually formed their own uh, diocese. There's a, uh, wow. there's a Slovak Catholic diocese. It's under the Pope, but it's not part of the Pittsburgh Roman Catholic diocese. Oh, wow. Huh. They have uh, churches uh, all over the, well, several churches in the Pittsburgh area, plus their diocese extends beyond Pennsylvania even. With wow. uh, churches in Detroit, and I believe there's one in New Jersey. Oh, wow. Huh. I, they, yeah. The mass is slightly different than the Roman Catholic mass. It's a little different, huh? Yeah. Right, slightly different. Uh, they sing uh, about 90% 90, 90 of it is in English now. When, when she was growing up, when I first met her, it was it was 100% Slovak in Slovak for a mass. Wow. <clears throat> well, Helen has another question here in the chat. Were Slovak streetcar parishes found in other cities as well as in Philadelphia? Um, that's well the 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 discussion of pittsburgh got me thinking a uh, june graniter alexander has her first book i think it was a, about uh the pittsburgh and i forget what it's called slovak community and if i'm remembering it correctly a similar thing happened there that there were well it was a bigger uh population uh, of uh slovaks but they were coming from various parts of uh you know the old country and I think, if I'm remembering it correctly, there were about three or four uh, uh, Catholic, and, and then she talks about the Lutherans, which is another, and I had to curtail to talk today, but I think they all were, you know, drawing people from different parts of Pittsburgh based on their, uh, you know, affiliation. And then in the coal country and some of those places, you did have, I don't know, you know, streetcar, whatever, maybe they had streetcars or maybe they just had a walk, but 
uh, they did have smaller uh, coal villages, right, that they all couldn't um, support one uh, a, ch a church of their own. So they drew, you know, from some of the uh, smaller uh, coal patch uh, towns uh, into one uh, parish. So I, th I think it was a bigger kind of phenomenon. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Michael Kopanik again says, also, do you know if regional origin played a role in which Slovak fraternal society that Slovaks chose to join and socialize in? Uh, I don't know if it, I don't, you, in other words, like uh, some to the NSS or some to the Slovak Catholic Sokol, that kind of thing. I guess, uh, yeah. Yeah, that I don't <laughs> know. But a lot of the, uh, lodges I looked at did have like members who came not exclusively but you know the vast majority would be from uh the same uh region or or cluster of villages uh for example uh and I forget you know the number of the lodge but uh National Slovak Society in Leechburg Pennsylvania uh was yeah okay I see yeah so that I don't know like if uh, you know, some from a different region said we don't, we're not going to deal with the Nova National Slovak Society. We'll be in, yeah, the uh, SUS or, or the Slovak Catholic Sokol uh, or Yevnota. But um, anyway, like the one in Leechburg, it was named after, after whatever village, like the lodge, because, you know, some of the lodges were the, uh, you know, William Penn in Philadelphia National Slovak Society Lodge, but they were the trench in whatever lodge. And and then it, others, you know, yeah, uh, like I think it was Elizabeth, New Jersey, the vast majority were from a few villages uh, in uh, 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 almost the same ones that my family were from in Garfield, uh, uh, Haitovka and uh, Sarah, uh, uh, Molly Lipnik and Stara Lubovna, those places. So uh, that I know there were those kind of chain migrations, but but it could well be. I, I just didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it sounds like Michael says, yeah, it did happen that way. <laughs> also oh, in Pittsburgh, know. there were whole, uh, Slovak cemeteries. And in one of them is buried Andy Warhol. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess, okay, where I, that's, it sounds like, I, I'm, I don't want to presume, but like I always say Slovak, and that's what my grandma said, but my family were Byzantine Catholic, and Michael, I see in the chat, is just asking, and of course, some people that I interviewed, I didn't talk about it, there was a, is still Holy Ghost, the now Byzantine Catholic, or Gretzko, Katolitska Church, in that Point Breeze, um, similarly translocal, but you know, some people say, oh, we were Rusin, we weren't Slovak. I, you know, in Philadelphia, there were members of the same family, descendants of the same, you know, grandparents who were at Holy Ghost, the Greek Catholic, and were now at St. Agnes, uh, and others who had, there was a horrible split, uh, and they went to, they said, we're Russian, and they're in the Russian Orthodox <laughs> Church, yeah. Uh, but but yeah, and I mean, I see, I see again, mixed re religion or mixed origin. I think a lot of them, because first of all, I can only speak my great grandparents by this point, right, came in 1900 and 1905. And some of the people I interviewed too said, you couldn't tell my mother, she was Slovak, she never heard of that, right? She came in 1900, it was Austria-Hungary. And, and people like my grandma always said, our people. And of course, now when I read something, it's like Nasha Ludia, like our people are our people, right? Yeah. Oh, and I see, yeah, there were some people said, again, in Point Breeze, there was Holy, Holy Ghost was the Byzantine Catholic Church. And then there was uh, Assumption of the Holy Virgin, which was the Russian Orthodox, because they had split off and the people who went to St. John and they said, the old ladies would sit there and watch who was coming off the streetcar, you know, who's dating whom, and you shouldn't go with him. He's a he's a Moss guy. And and this guy said, We were all born in Philadelphia. Toss, who the hell, what does it matter who you date? But 
the uh, Sarah Baba, right? There was a big deal. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Our next question is um, from Brian Pavlik. My ancestors landed in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Have you done any research in that area? That would be the Pittsburgh again. Pittsburgh. Yeah, Johnstown. yeah. Heading toward Pittsburgh. I haven't. But do you know Ava Morovska's work? Ava Morovska was my uh, advisor. Um, and she wrote a book for Bread with Butter, which is a great look at uh, all of the broadly defined Slavic communities in Johnstown, the Steel City. Um, and when she, you know, came out, whatever, and say, for argument's sake, 1990. So when she, you know, did the interview, she talked to a lot of people, whether they were Slovak, Polish, Croatian, uh, from the city. And then she did another one. Uh, on the Jewish community in Johnstown called Insecure Prosperity. Um, but no, I haven't looked at, you know, in a big way, Johnstown. But yeah, that was, uh, boy. And, oh, and then uh, there's a guy, uh, and he's a real dear guy. He's retired now, Jack Metzger. And his father, uh, uh, his father was a steel worker, in, and he grew up in Johnstown. And Jack wrote a book, Striking Steel, uh, about growing up in the steel community uh, of Johnstown. And those are those are three books, the Moravska books and, and uh, Jack's book that, that would give a sense about what Johnstown was like. But I, no, I haven't, you know. Done oh, that's good, thank this. you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Could you um, let's see, next question. I knew of a well-known Slovak American who came from Trenton, New Jersey. Do you know if there was a Slovak American enclave there? Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, they're definitely in that Southeast uh, Philadelphia um, uh, uh, National Slovak Society, Southeast Philadelphia region. Uh, mm -hmm. That was, Trenton was one of the uh, uh, communities, right? That, that these folks in Philly would, uh, if it was a sporting event, compete against or, or uh, a patron, you know, attend if they had a theater thing. And, you know, in uh, the newspaper of the NS, the Narodni Novini, there would always be those notices. Um, I don't know where in Trenton, but I would suspect it was the old first ward, because that was in my, and again, newspaper days, uh, and I couldn't get out of it, because uh, in grad school, I was like, yeah, I still have to pay rent. So I worked at the Trenton uh, paper, uh, I wasn't proud. It, <laughs> it's a, a, a kind of a tabloid paper, kind of a New York Post for Trenton. Uh, and anyway, uh, there was at that point, 1996 or so, uh, still some nice restaurants in, in the first ward of Trenton, uh, mm. you know, Kobasi and whatnot. Uh, but I, but I don't know, I don't know where, you know, or, or <clears throat> specifically, but but there definitely was. A Slovak community in Trenton, uh, New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. There was a relative. This is Michael Kaponik again. There was a relative from Philly, my grandfather's sister, Carl and Teresa Pekartsik, 1896-1975. Hmm. Note the spelling, Magyarized. For instance, many Spishaks joined the NSS. That's, I guess, the National Sokols. And Sharish often joined Slovak Catholic circles. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I see. That's fascinating. I mean, it would be you know interesting to see. Uh, okay, and he was a butcher, huh? The the thing about the modularization, you know, when we were trying to find all the like everybody trying to do the genealogy, and my Slovak great grandpa was uh, Stefan uh, Hanat, right, H-N-A-T. Couldn't find him in the ship's manifests or anything. And of course, he appears as Istvan, mm -hmm. which is Madyar for Stephen. So we finally found him. He arrived in 1900. But yeah. I think in Bethlehem, where my family lived, there was a national circles and a Catholic circles. And they used to have fights all the time. You know, you couldn't belong to both of them. Yeah. <laughs> you could only join one or the other. It, and it's funny. It yeah. was the same thing. You know, it was like, oh, well, he goes to the Nats and we don't bother with them. So. Yeah. <laughs> the Nats my, and the Cats. 
my guys said that uh, it was the SGUS, the Slovak Gymnastic Union, Sokol, I guess, and they called them the Narodnys, right, the Nationals, oh. as opposed to the Catholics. Uh, but NSS wasn't that the National Slovak Society? But that that reminds Dr. Moravska, <laughs> who was from Poland, she came already as an adult. And she said, Bob, I am never, um, I am always amazed by how peacocky people can be. You know, those kind of fine distinctions, you're them and we're that. Even that, you know, we, we use a different word for potatoes, so we can't be in the same parish. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that, that's really serious. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Helen says, the immigrant church and community. Pittsburgh Slovak Catholics and Lutherans, 1880 to 1915 by June Renatier Alexander. Okay. Yes, Here's... that's that's the one. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a a, a good book. Yeah, of, of uh, the look at <laughs> at Pittsburgh, which, uh, like probably most of you, you know, the extended family uh, went a lot. We had people in Pittsburgh and Aliquippa, uh, and some of those, but you know, of course the the connection and i would love to, and i'm sure there's a you know if i dig hard enough but my grandma knew who all these people were and i think i said to you yesterday even in uh bethlehem area uh there was a, a part of our family and you know i i knew who they were but after my grandma passed away it's like hard to remember where everybody is yeah mm -hmm. okay michael says did you look at the slovak byzantine parishes the Greek yes Catholic yes religion first but were often of mixed slovak and Rusyn origin it often depended on whom you married and who insisted on going to which church yeah i think that that's probably true and and the luck of the draw if you were devoted to it my my uh grandma it, she was raised again in in the greek right the byzantine right um and you know, later, because uh, of geography and whatever, you know, we went always to just the local Catholic parish, but she still would go back to Passaic for events. And, you know, she, and by the way, uh, it, it when I was doing a lot of the research, it, it, it was very lucky because Philadelphia had the Balch Institute for Ethnic Studies, mm -hmm. which has a lot of those great church books. So I said, oh, I wonder, and lo and behold, they had material from her parish, and there it was in the 50th anniversary, and she was head of the sodality and whatever. <laughs> it was like, and she was still around and, and very healthy still, thank goodness. And I took Xerox and she said, Oh, yeah, I joined all that stuff. I was like, You you were you were a big shot to, but yeah, I think a lot of it depends. Um Word fair I could look because I have the old word maps. They at some point Philadelphia got rid of like a lot of cities. At one point they had like multiple wards with even two aldermen per ward. And that now they went to I think seven. That's it. But I have the old word maps so I can look and uh you know email you or whatever where that would have been, Ward 35. Off the top of my head, I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't that be like in the census? Those are enumeration districts, but sometimes- No, no, say... no, no, that, that would be different. Um, this was for political purposes and, and wow. Philadelphia at one point had, a, I wanna say 48 wards wow. that they chopped the city up into. and. Uh, in that roughly uh, progressive era, uh, yeah, uh, they they eventually shrunk the city council uh, in the interests, I guess, of uh, you know uh, economics or something. But let me see. I don't know. If oh, I can... okay. He found it in the 1940 census. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they put and the words in there in the census. So. That's funny. Yeah, Let's that see. they would have. Okay. I am. Um, uh, wow. I have that 1940 census for my relatives. Yeah. I, if I can find it on my on my I, desktop here, where is it? <laughs> now they finally the 1950 became available. Now, didn't it? Oh yeah. Uh huh. 
which was great. Okay, let's see. Do I have it here? Ah, I have the 1920 word maps. We 35, you said. Um, 35. Where are you, 35? It's it's a really crazy map too, because as they split it, at first it was logical, you know, one is next to two, and then as they split, they just Oh, 35 is like the Northeast of Philadelphia. That Torresdale, Frankfurt kind of area I was talking about. So like it would have been, if Philadelphia is like a big pork chop, it's like that part that's jutting up to the Northeast became Ward 35. So they were kind of moving out to the quasi suburbs by that point. Yeah, by 1940, maybe they got a car. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Although they still at that point they still had trolleys out there. But yeah, that was like, you know, the secondary settlement where you were finally beginning to get a little nicer. <laughs> yeah, 48 is where Bonsell Street was, word 48. Yeah, yeah, that's 48. See if I was right. Yes, that's Grace Ferry. Okay. Well, actually, it's it, but but Bonsall sticks in my head as Grace Ferry. But on this map, and again, this is the 1914, 1920 word mm. map. Uh, by they could have split a little more, but in this one, it's everything west of it looks like 18th Street, and everything south of Moore Street, right to the Schuylkill River. Okay which would be kind of where the Philly Stadium is now and, and the Eagle Stadium. Mm, okay. Part of, that would be that part of South, South Philadelphia, yeah. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? You can just unmute and ask Professor Zecker. Well, I don't see, hear anybody. <laughs> Okay, I found this fascinating because I do have that, um, you know, I have some context having those collateral relatives right there in Philadelphia that I just found out about by searching yeah. DNA matches. Um, I find these DNA matches and I'm like, who are these people? I don't know anybody in Philadelphia, but I traced them back through the censuses. And now I know how they're related. It's, it's, I, I think we're all, I mean, us, myself too, on my mom's side, I'm half Italian. And this is, I don't want to be like totally autobiographical, but she was an only child and for other reasons didn't live very long. But um, when I was about 49, so 12 years ago now, uh, I get an email and it's like, by any chance, are you related to Charlie Albanese of Newark, New Jersey? Yeah, my grandpa, and it's the second cousin of mine. And now through her, I've reconnected with all these people um, on the Italian side who we didn't know at all, which mm, was really yeah. delightful. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of lose touch with your cousins when you grow up, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, and then how many, we, we counted, like this is most immigrant families and a friend, not a friend, or somebody, when I was in Slovakia, we, we were looking at how many people he said, 10 and you know she had 10 kids and then this person at 12 well that was before television but um my yeah my my italian grand, great grandparents they it was a family of 10 and then how many do, kids do they have and we counted like there's about 140 of us <laughs> from wow. that one great grandfather yeah 